Okay, so I'm going to attempt to give a rundown of topic three for Edexcel GCSE Physics, uh, which is energy. And um, there are two energy topics at the GCSE. There's one in paper one, which is this. There's one in paper two, which is slightly shorter and has some different content, but also has some crossover. So if you think I've missed some stuff out, maybe I have, I'm trying to do it quickly, but also it could be that it's in the other part of the energy topic, which is the paper two. And I'm concentrating here on the paper one stuff. So firstly, what is energy? Well, energy is the ability to do work. or the ability to do something. If you haven't got energy, you can't do anything. And it's measured in joules with the symbol J. Now a really important um, principle that we must know about to be able to talk about energy is the conservation of energy, the principle of the conservation of energy. And you've probably heard this before, it's quite famous. It says that energy cannot be created or destroyed only transferred from one form to another. So the amount of energy in the universe was fixed at the moment of the Big Bang. We've not got any more or any, any less than we did then. Uh, it just keeps changing form. It keeps changing stores because it's transferred continually. So this word form, probably nowadays at the GCSE, would say store. Um, it's, a, it's not a new thing. It's just a new way of... Well, uh, more recent way of thinking about energy. Energy has stores and transfers. Um, at Key Stage 3 you could have all just talked about types of energy, but now you're going to think about which types are stores and which types are transfers. So energy stores are when energy can be held in that um, form, uh, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight main ones to know about. Uh, the famous ones are GPE and KE. Now GPE is gravitational potential energy. I'll swear either. Um, anything with a height will have GPE, so if you've lifted something up it has gravitational potential energy, it can fall. And Ke is kinetic energy, and kinetic means moving, so anything that's moving has kinetic energy. There's also in, this, um, in the ones with these initials, EPE, which is elastic potential energy. And you look at that in more detail in a later topic. Um, but if you stretch or compress anything, um, so when you let it go, it can spring back to its original shape. It has elastic potential energy. Then we have thermal energy. Hot things store thermal energy. Uh, we have chemical and nuclear energy. So if you think about chemistry, when you put two chemicals together, there's a reaction. Some energy is often released. That energy was stored in the chemical bonds of the um, elements or the compounds that you're using. Uh, nuclear energy is looking inside the nucleus of the atom. So chemical energy is about the electrons and how they're bonded to the atom, whereas nuclear energy is all about how inside the nucleus the protons and neutrons are bonded together. And then finally, we have electrostatic and magnetic energy stores. So think about if you've got a magnet, um, it can stick to another magnet. Um, when you pull it apart, it takes effort, so it takes energy, so it has some energy. It had some energy before. So they're the stores that you need to know about. There are then transfers, and the transfers are a little bit trickier to kind of get your head around. Now, the most obvious ones are light, sound, heat, and electricity. So energy cannot be stored in these forms. You can't store light. You can't put light in a box and keep it there. Um, it can transfer as that and then store as something else. Same with sound, heat and electricity. Um, light is often also known as biradiation. Um, and you could also use that for heat because heat is infrared, um, which is just a different form of light. Um, sometimes people use it for sound because they're saying it's by waves, but also sometimes people say that sound is mechanically. Um, and mechanically is the, the kind of the fifth way, and I'm gonna give it another name, that's by forces. So if, if the energy is not transferred by any of these easier ones, light, sound, heat, electricity, it's probably transferred by forces, and that's when something is moving. Uh, so if I push a box, I'm transferring energy by forces because I'm pushing it and pushing and working against friction. So you can, any situation where energy is transferred, we can represent it in an energy transfer diagram. And here is a very, very simple one. Now, the way that they're often drawn for this exam is you have a box or a starting point, 
and the starting point and the end point, which is also a box, has to be a store. So energy cannot be stored as a transfer, so it has to be a store at the start and the end. And then along the arrow, you have your transfer. This is a very simple one where I'm starting with one energy, transferring by one type and then storing as another type. But in real life, they're much, much more complex than this. But a really common example is dropping a ball from a height. So if you've got a ball at a height, maybe you've picked it up, it will have GPE. So you'll start with the ball having GPE. At the end, as it falls, just before it hits the ground, it's going very fast, it's got a lot of speed, it's now moving. That GPE has been transferred to kinetic energy. And it's not been transferred by light, sound, heat or electricity, so it must have been transferred by forces because it's moving. Um, that's the simple one. If you were thinking about in real life and you're dropping a ball through air, um, the air in the ball would slightly heat up as it fell because of air resistance. So you could also add in there Ke plus some thermal energy of the surroundings um, and you could add in by forces and heat here. Um, heat and thermal, important distinction between them. Heat is when you transfer the source and the energy, sorry, and thermal is when you store it. So that brings us on to two main types of energy that we need to know some equations for and that is GPE and Ke which is why I've gone for those two in that last example. So I said before that GPE is given to any object that has a height where it's above ground level and the equation for GPE is this delta GPE now delta means change in it's a Greek letter so change in GPE equals mg delta h equals mass times gravitational field strength times the change in height. And you'll often see this written without the deltas in there, without the triangles. Um, gravitational field strength is also known as acceleration due to gravity, and you know that it is 10 meters per second squared. Hopefully you can see that just about. Um, and also mg as an equation is a thing, um, and that equals weight. So you'll sometimes see GP written as GPE equals weight time change in height. Kinetic energy. Um, has a symbol Ke, the moving object. So if it's moving, it needs to have speed in the equation. And it's quite a tricky equation here. It is one half mv squared. So one half times mass times velocity, the speed squared. Um, to be fair, this is speed because it's a scalar. Um, people often forget to square and also often forget to half. And this is one of the trickier equations in the GCSE, so it's often kind of brought out in terms of rearranging for harder topics. So if you wanted to rearrange this equation in terms of velocity, it would be as follows. Firstly, I need to move that 2 that's on the bottom to the other side, so I get 2Ke. I need to move the m down here, it equals v squared, and then I square root that side. So this is the rearrangement that's quite tricky to do. Now, GP and Ke, if we think about the last example, I dropped a ball from a height and the GPE turned into Ke, it transferred to Ke. So what often happens is you'll have to work this out in a sum. And if we think about the conservation of energy, energy can't be created or destroyed, just transferred, we can say that GPE lost equals Ke gained. This is in a perfect world where we ignore things like air resistance. Or in the opposite direction, so if I throw a ball up in the air, I might be able to say it the other way around, I could say that GPE gained equals Ke lost. Um, and in that case, I can equate these two equations. I can say that MGH equals one half MV squared. And the useful thing about this is that I can cancel out one of the terms. I can cancel out M it's on both sides so to work out how fast something is going when you drop it you don't actually need to know the mass of the object you just need to know how high it traveled from so let's say I wanted to work out how fast my ball was when I dropped it um, at the end of the fall I should say I could write this as 2gh equals v squared or I can square root the v to get 2gh and that is also quite commonly done especially for more tricky questions at the end of the paper um, a final equation to know about for this topic is efficiency. And efficiency has a main way of um, working it out, and that is this. Efficiency is the useful energy transferred by an object divided by the total energy in. And then we can, if we want to, optionally times by 100 to make a percentage. Um, you can write efficiency as a percentage or as a decimal or even as a fraction. Um, for
for example, let's say I've got a light bulb. I'm really good at drawing light bulbs. And the light bulb uses 100 joules per second, but it only gives out light at a rate of 60 joules per second. The efficiency would be the energy that's usefully transferred, which is light, um, and that would be 60, divided by the total energy, which would be 100 times 100, and the efficiency is 60%. The other 40 joules have been wasted, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, they'd probably be here wasted as heat. Um, now we can put that into a diagrammatic form here with something called a Sankey diagram. So this is a Sankey diagram. And a Sankey diagram tries to show this, but in a diagram. And we start with the energy in on one side and then we have the energy out. And convention states that the one at the top is usually the useful energy out. And then the arrow that starts to go downwards usually is the wasted energy. Now, it's not perfect here, but this arrow should be the same width the whole way through. So the total width here should equal the width here plus there. So if I call this, let's say one, and this two, and this three, one should equal two plus three, because energy can't be created or destroyed, we can't lose it, it has to just transfer. Um, so it's easiest to draw this on squared paper to help you. Um, you don't have to have two arrows, you can have lots more arrows than that. Uh, you could have lots of different types of wasted energy, and in real life, Sankey diagrams are pretty complex. Uh, but usually in the exam, there's only two or three arrows. For this example, I would label this with electricity, because that's energy that's going in, and then I'd label the useful as light, and then the wasted, which will be heat, as so, and it's about the right size for that. Which brings me on to this idea here that efficiency is always less than 100%. So in real life, or IRL, I'm gonna be down with the kids, in real life, efficiency is always less than 100%. You do not get 100% efficient um, systems. Um, and that's because energy is always dissipated. I'm gonna try and spell this correctly. Dissipated. Now dissipated means spread out to surroundings and it's usually as heat which then becomes the thermal energy of the surroundings and um, it can be not heat like if you want something to be hot then something else would be the energy that you wasted maybe it's sound or light if for example you know, you're heating something up uh, with a fire uh, the light energy isn't needed it's a bit of waste, um, but usually that dissipated energy will be heat. And the word dissipated is a really useful one to know for the exam. Now we need to know how we can reduce these energy losses um, to try and make um, the efficiency as close to 100% as possible. And these are just things to learn. If you've got a mechanical system that's with moving parts to reduce energy losses, you lubricate to reduce friction. Because when you reduce friction, you reduce the work done against the friction and you reduce how much heat is being lost to it. Um, so lubricating to reduce friction will reduce energy losses for mechanical systems. Um, for electrical systems, we use low resistance wires. So less energy is lost as heat. And this is something you'll look at in more detail when it comes to electricity. And then to try and reduce heat loss, um, which is quite a big part of this topic, for example, in a house, what you need to try and do is, um, well, you, you thermally insulate. And you do that in two ways. You decrease the thermal conductivity of the object, or you increase its thickness. So thermal conductivity is a measure of how well something conducts heat. Um, so if we want something to be insulated, we don't want it to conduct heat, so we try and decrease that. Um, and the main examples that they use for this is in a house. So in a house, there's lots of things to do to try and uh, decrease heat loss. Um, I'll try and remember all of them now. Uh, firstly, often we have cavity wall insulation. So even if you don't have this, all houses have got two layers of brick with a gap in the middle. Um, this reduces heat loss because actually air is quite a good insulator, so it means you're reducing the thermal conductivity of the house. Um, they often, in newer builds, 
or in old builds where people have had this done, they fill this with cavity wall insulation, which is a really good insulator. Um, and that once again reduces the thermal conductivity of the house. Other things that we always do that you might not even realise, um, loft insulation, that's there to stop heat getting out at the top, um, having curtains and also having carpets and draft excluders. So you might have, that's not how you spell draft, I don't think, sorry. Um, you might have one of those like bristly things at the bottom of your door on your, or you're on your um, letterbox or even maybe like a homemade sausage um, or snake looking like thing that you put at the doors in winter. All of these things try and stop heat escaping. So the final part of this section um, is quite separate and it is about energy resources and how we kind of use energy in the world around us. Um, here are the main energy resources that you need to know about. Fossil fuels, nuclear, wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, wave and tidal, which are separate things but I run out of space, and biomass. And for each of these, you should know slightly how they work. I'm not going to go through that in massive detail here because it'll take me about half an hour. Uh, you should know if they're renewable or not and be able to give some advantages and disadvantages. So fossil fuels is coal, oil and gas. Uh, they're definitely not renewable. And to make electricity essentially from them, these basically are all electricity sources in the end, we burn them to boil water to make steam to spin a turbine, which then uh, drives a generator. Um, advantages of fossil fuels is that they're extremely extremely reliable. They can, we can use them at any point in time of the day, it doesn't matter what the weather is, it will always work. So they're reliable, they're pretty cheap. Um, we have our system set up for them to work. They've got quite a lot of disadvantages. Um, mainly they are, or they release CO2 and other greenhouse gases. I'm just going to write CO2 here. And they are going to run out. These are the big problems. And the really big one is releasing carbon dioxide because that is the main driver of climate change, um, which is going to be a common theme in our advantages or disadvantages. So I'm just going to write there. Climate change, once again, would love to go on about that now, but haven't got time. Uh, nuclear power also is not renewable. We will, we will run out of nuclear um, fuel however not for thousands of years so often people say it's sustainable because it's we've got enough of it for a long time um, advantages once again it's reliable um, we can use it at any point in time of the day whatever the weather is it's extremely efficient compared to um, fossil fuels you get an awful lot of energy out of a tiny amount of fuel it's relatively cheap once it's set up um, the big one does not release CO2. So massive deal. Um, it doesn't release CO2 and it's reliable. However, disadvantages, it does produce radioactive waste, which we're not exactly sure yet how to deal with. Um, they're quite expensive to set up and decommission. Decommission means uh, take out of action. And also there's a perceived risk. People have the idea that radioactive so our nuclear power is really dangerous. It actually isn't compared to um, fossil fuels. Less people have died from nuclear accidents than have died in coal power stations or the whole process of making coal-fired power stations. Right, we're going to... Oh, how it works. It uses nuclear um, fusion to boil the water to spin the turbine to make the electricity. Right, wind is renewable. It's always there. Um, Basically, wind spins a turbine, which then drives a generator. Um, advantages, it is free once set up. Um, no CO2. And renewable, which is already got there. Disadvantages, um, only works when windy. Um, and it's quite damaging to... Some people can are worried about the birds and the environment. Um, it's noisy. And it looks ugly. I don't think it does. I like how they look personally, but um, some people say they look ugly. They're noisy. They can kill birds. Um, it depends. You have to weigh up the benefits and the risks there. Solar power, also renewable. Advantages, same. Free when set up. No CO2. Um, this works a little bit differently to everything else. It doesn't drive a turbine. It is a photovoltaic cell. Uh, disadvantages only works when sunny, which in England is not that often, so it's probably not our best uh, one to look for. 
but otherwise it's pretty good. Uh, geothermal is also renewable. Geothermal is when we use the energy of the earth to boil water, to create steam, to turn a turbine, blah de blah. Um, advantages, it's free, there's no CO2, and so on. Uh, disadvantages, it isn't everywhere. You usually have to be somewhere where there's a geezer um, or somewhere where it's easy to get to the hot water from inside. It's from inside the earth geothermal power. It's the heat of the interior of the earth that does it. Um, and it can't damage environments. Again, you have to basically build a power station around it or some kind of setup around it. Um, and you'll find that these are basically common for most of these. Um, hydroelectric, that is when you've got falling water. So hydroelectric, you have a lake or a reservoir of water at the top of a mountain. And then when we need electricity, they don't always use it. Um, as you open the reservoir, the reservoir water will fall down a mountain through turbines, which will turn the turbines and produce electricity. Um, so it is renewable. Advantages is that it is reliable. You can use it whenever you want, but you can't use it all the time because you have to get the water back up to the top so the water doesn't keep flowing you have to keep putting the water back up to the reservoir so it's reliable um, and can be used for peak um, energy use so for example in the middle of a soap when everyone turns on the kettle uh, we have a real spike in energy need so that's when we turn on the hydroelectricity in the UK um, disadvantages you still have to pump the water back up and that can take more energy than it takes to, for it to go down. Um, you also uh, have to flood or damage environments or habitats to make it. I'm sorry, there's no CO2 technically in the uh, use when we're making the electricity here, but we might have to use other types of energy, maybe fossil fuels, to get the water back up. Um, this is not happening very quickly, sorry. Wave and tidal. So wave and tidal, they are slightly separate, but they both use movement of water to spin a turbine. Wave does it at coastline, tidal does it usually at the mouth of a river, but they are renewable. Advantages, they're free once set up, there's no CO2. Uh, they are reliable in terms of time, well, for tidal. Um, tides, we know when they're gonna come in and out, so they're reliable in that way. Waves, if it's a still ocean, you might not get as much. Uh, disadvantages, can't use them all the time. Sorry, my handwriting's terrible on this one today. And they can damage environments. So you have to, for example, build a massive tidal barrage across the mouth of a river, which could damage the habitat of some of um, animals. And then finally, there's biomass. Now, biomass is when you grow things to burn. So they do it a lot in Brazil. They grow a lot of sugar cane for this. It is renewable because once you've burnt them, you can regrow them. Um, advantages, it's renewable. Uh, net CO2 equals zero. So it, it does release CO2 when you burn it, but when you then regrow it, you'll get the same amount of CO2 back from the atmosphere. Um, disadvantages still release the CO2, uh, apart from if you don't grow it back, um, takes up a lot of land. So to have enough biofuels, you're going to use a lot of land up there. So that wasn't a very quick uh, recap, but there we are. And then finally, you need to know about the energy trends, they call it. So we're going to think about the UK energy mix currently, how it's changed over time, what might happen in the future. So here is a very rough pie chart of the percentages that we use for um, the UK energy resources. And the biggest use, which I'm gonna say is here, um, is gas. So gas is our biggest energy resource that we use. It used to be coal, but it's massively reduced. This is now coal, um, but it used to be the other way around. Uh, gas is the cleanest of the three fossil fuels. So if you're gonna use a fossil fuel power station, which is reliable and pretty cheap and efficient and blah, blah, blah and all of that, um, gas is the best one to use if you wanna try and help the environment slightly. Um, it would be better not to use it, but our system is built up around it and therefore it's quite hard to just not use it. So gas is our biggest one. And then just behind that is oil. Oil isn't usually used so much in terms of power production, but it's used a lot for transport when it comes to petrol, etc., things like that. Um, the smallest one here is not renewables, it's nuclear. And that's reduced, the, there aren't any, uh, well, there aren't many new nuclear plants in the making. 
Uh, we used a lot more nuclear in the past, but they've been slowly decommissioned and people aren't a massive fan of it because of the perceived risk. I personally think we should go towards nuclear to try and um, use less CO2, but still have reliable electricity, but there we are, which means that this section here is the renewables. So you can see it's not a massive part of the UK energy mix. It's about 10, 12%. Um, but it's bigger than it was. It used to be about 0.5% and that was all hydroelectricity. Um, for the UK, the best ones to use are wind because we're the windiest country in Europe, um, hydroelectric, tidal, waves. We've got a lot of coastline. Um, solar, not so great for us. So the energy use over the years for the world, then have a look at the world, have increased. And this is how much CO2 has been produced per year, a rough sketch, across time. We can see that that's increased. Now, why is that increased and when is this increase happening? Well, the amount of CO2 that we produce as humans or in the Earth was pretty stable until this point here. And this is about 1850-ish, because at 1850, we had the Industrial Revolution. It's actually the second Industrial Revolution, because the first one was quite small scale. But this is when we start to use factories, we start to burn coal to make steam um, and steam engines. Um, this is not, a lot of people think, oh, this is when we invented cars and electricity. No, cars and electricity are invented about here, um, and then widespread use is about here, 1950. So about then, we're getting widespread use of cars and electricity in the home. Uh, before then, we did have them, but not everyone had them. In World War II, only half of households in the UK had electricity, from what I know. Um, so that starts to um, help the increase carry on. Um, also throughout this we've got population increase. Um, we go from I think it's about 1 billion people here to 7 billion people here and obviously more people means more energy is going to be used. So it's good to have a kind of idea of the times for that. Um, finally thinking about the future. Now we know that there is a climate crisis and that people, it's really, apart from coronavirus, which we're currently in, if you're watching this after COVID-19, good to know that we survived it. Um, there's a climate crisis that people are really worried about. Um, that means we're trying to use more renewables because we know we have to. However, governments are not always inclined to do this because where our economy is built on fossil fuels and it's quite a big step to say, no, we're gonna stop that. Um, also, there are emerging economies. So over in Asia, places like India and China, they're really experiencing an economic boom and they are building a lot more coal and gas fired power stations because they've not had that much power before and now they are. They're not as advanced in terms of their, well, they can be, uh, but in terms of their economy yet to go towards the renewables. So they're increasing their use of gas and oil. So as we're trying to claw that back, they're increasing it. You know, you could argue, why shouldn't they? We've had our time of it. It's our fault that it's such a bad situation now. Uh, but you do that does cause a problem because it means we're not getting as much progress as we need. So the future is kind of very vague. Um, hopefully we will see a big reduction in the use of fossil fuels and non-renewables and we'll see more renewables, which will reduce the problems of climate change. But there is a lot more to, about it than just saying, oh, we'll all just switch to wind. It's a lot harder than that. So my quick rundown has now taken nearly half an hour. Apologies. Um, there will be another video for the second half of energy, which is in paper two. That should be shorter because it's a much shorter topic. Uh, but hopefully that was helpful at just reigniting any kind of thoughts about that topic.